I bring you greetings um, on behalf of New Salem Baptist Church. As he said, my pastor, Dr. Keith A. Troy, who is like a father to me. Um, as I say this, if you could get it in your Bible, 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, if you can begin to turn to 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. I also want to uh, thank Dr. Shaw and the wonderful people of Liberty Hill Baptist Church. Thank you for having me this morning. On this wonderful day, I want to give greetings to all of the birth mothers, the mothers, the grandmothers, godmothers, mothers of the church, mothers-in-law, mothers-in-name, mothers-in-deed, mothers-in-law, anybody who has a mother or who is a mother, happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to also thank my younger brother, Jeremy, who traveled with me this morning. But most of all, I thank Jesus Christ. Amen. Because every time I'm allowed to step um, up into a sacred desk, um, or even whether it be on the streets or one-on-one, -on -one, I think it as an awesome privilege to God to be able to proclaim his word. And so thank you, Jesus Christ, most of all, for just saving me and using me. And uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, just for your power. We thank you for a brand new day. And not only did you give us breath, life, strength, and health, you gave us brand new grace and mercy. And so we thank you, God, and we walk in it, and we celebrate you, we honor you, and we ask this simply, God, that you would have your way. Thank you for this time and for this service. Thank you for this house and this leadership. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, God, one more time that if I can just be your mic and you speak through me, I promise, Lord, I will give you all the honor, all the glory, and all of the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so if we can um, read from 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, I have the New International um, Version um, of that. And the title of this um, over this scripture, um, this piece of scripture is often called the widow's oil. But if you need a title for this lecture, it's from the vantage point of the vessel. And it says in that scripture, the wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all of your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept on pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and told the man of God, he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Amen. Amen. So while speaking on this occasion of Mother's Day, I realized that the text is pertinent because it is Mother's Day. Why? Because there's a loving mother in this story, and I'm sure there are loving mothers in this house. But there are also mothers that probably belong to this house who are forced to take care of children, if not all the time, but sometimes on their own. There are mothers who may be caught up in single parent situations. There are those who are stepping in on behalf of mothers because of their situations. And if this woman lived today and her situation was today, she would be a woman in the church. She would be a woman in the church. Her husband was a man of God. He belonged to a school of prophets. But the problem that we have here is not that he belonged to church. It's not that he was a man of God. But the problem is he died. And when he died, he left bills. 
Anybody got bills? Uh -huh. <laughs> so he died and he left bills. And he left something that needed to be paid for. And if we look at the story, we notice that the creditors didn't go after her house. It didn't go after her animals. The creditors didn't go after her clothes. The creditors didn't go after her shoes. The creditors didn't be go after her belongings. The creditors went after her children. Why? It went, he went after what was most valuable to her, her children, her sons. Similarly today, people often think that the enemy is after your job. We think that the world wants our clothes. The world wants our belongings. We think that we have these big haters who want what belongs to us, but if we really think about what the enemy is coming after, what the world is seeking after, it's coming after our future. It's coming after our generation. The enemy doesn't want to just snatch your house. He wants to destroy your household. Okay? And so while we are so caught up in protecting our car and protecting our shoes and protecting our belongings, we need to think about protecting our children. Right? Do we get as desperate as this woman when we see the enemy coming right into the house to steal the children away? I'm just wondering that. I'm wondering that. Because the world, if we look at the news and the media, the world wants our children. If we look at where advertising is focused most, it's on our future. Billions and billions of dollars going out every year. Why? Because they want our young people. Yeah. Why? Because that's our most valuable. I don't want to call them a commodity, but really that's our most valuable asset. Our young people. And just like in the story, the world was coming to get them. And if we think about why would, you know, she probably had some stuff, but why would he come straight after children? Why are the enemy coming straight after children? Number one, they are our future, but also young people can be put to work for you or against you. All right. They can be put to work and they can work for years. You think about it, they could have took her, but they didn't want her. They wanted the two sons, why? Because they could work and be put to work for years. Why? Because they were strong and they're strongly influenced. Why? Why does the world want our children? Because they can be disciplined and discipled in any way someone puts time Come into. on now. Yeah. They can be disciplined and discipled in any way, either in the church or on the street. We got young disciples. Oh, right. mm -hmm. We have young disciples. And he said, why are they coming after the children? Because they have gifts and talents that have not yet been revealed. Why are you coming after the children? Because the result of their life's work cannot be known or quantified. So at the end of the day, they're coming after the sons and the children because they are not just valuable, they're invaluable. Because when you don't know the cost or the price of something, it's oh, invaluable. Oh. It's priceless. You can't put a name, a number to how much it's worth. The young people, I hope we understand this, that the young people are invaluable yeah. and that the enemy and the world wants to take them. Right? So, as we read the story, time is of the essence, as we read the story, we see that it ends well. Right? I read the end. It ends well. We see that the desperate mother goes to the man of God. And the man of God, he gives her three things. He gives her a question, a direction, and then a solution. Okay? So he gives her a question. He asks her, what do you have? And at first she says, I have nothing at all. Because she didn't realize what she had. So she said, I have nothing at all but just a little bit of oil. Then he gives her a direction. He says, go ask all your neighbors for their jars. Shut you and your sons in the house. Pour oil into the jars until there are no vessels left. 
until there are no vessels left. And then he not only gives her a question and direction, but when she follows the direction, he gives her a solution. He says, go sell your oil, pay your debts, and live off the rest. Amen? Oh. See, I have to stop right there. He gives her a question, a direction, and a solution. Right. And there is a happy ending. We could all walk away right there. But I believe there are numerous lessons in this text for each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Now the issue is, I don't have time to tell you every single lesson. See, I can give you lessons from every single point of view, because the lesson you have, you have to understand that the lesson you take is based on the perspective you look at. Mm. So, I could tell you the lessons from the perspective of the prophet, but I realize on this Mother's Day, <laughs> Not everybody in here is a prophet, right? There may be a prophet or prophetic people in the room, but not everybody in here is a prophet. Even on Mother's Day, I can give you the perspective or lessons that the mother could have learned, but not everybody in here is a mother. Neither am I. I can give you the vantage point and lessons from the neighbors because everybody in here is a neighbor to somebody, now, right? Yes. We're all neighbors, and we should all be willing to share what we have, mm -hmm. but the issue in the story is the neighbors didn't see everything that happened. Oh. Uh -uh. So I'm going to have to give you the perspective from, and I'm going to quickly say it, from the vantage point of the vessel. Mm -hmm. Because if we allow ourselves to be, each and every one of us can be a vessel for the Lord. So, when we think about the vessel, that's all she had. The vessel was in the house. It had a little bit of oil. But the vessel wasn't looked at as being very valuable. Yeah. Right? But we have to understand this thing about vessels. Look around at each and every person you see. Look around, look around, look around. Okay. The vessel is not valuable because of what it looked like. Yeah. The vessel is not valuable because how it's shaped. Yeah. The vessel is not valuable because of its color or size, but it's val valuable because of what is inside it. Okay? So the vessel is valuable because of what is right. in it, yes. and then it can be used when what is in it comes out of it. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay? So... When we think about the question of being a vessel, think about that vessel sitting on the shelf. They see issues happening all around it. The house is in crisis. The vessel is in the house. Teach, the house is in crisis. But the vessel is not yet being used because what's inside of the vessel doesn't seem like it's very valuable. I bring this up because there are vessels in this house sitting in the midst of the people. And what happens is the vessel, you don't really know what's inside it because it has not been used yet. But if you look to you know left and right and you don't look at just who's sitting beside you if you look deeper with the eyes of God about what is inside them then there are solutions to the problems in this house sitting right next to you because if what is inside it gets poured out of it it doesn't matter the shape the color or the size the solution is already in the house right okay so since each of us are vessels right the question we have to ask ourselves, there's three quick questions I have. The first question is, am I available? Am I available? It doesn't matter if you're a vessel with a bunch of stuff in you if you're not, a vessel, if you're not available. And often in the church, in the body of Christ, our issue is not that we lack resources, we lack people. The problem is the people don't make themselves available. Right. So the question you have to ask yourself to the issues having happening in here, there are crises not just outside the church. There are crises happening inside the church. There are needs in the body. There are needs in the body. There are needs in the house. The question is, am I available to be used? So often we are so busy running from here to there, moving. Our, our, if we look at our schedules, they are so busy. Yes, they are. But am I available? When, when, when I'm, even when I'm walking around the street and I see a need, do I see myself in the perspective of somebody who's available? Are you available? If God asks you, are you available or are you too busy? Wow. 
Mm. Are you on his schedule or are he is he on yours? Mm. See, God gets on our schedule for Sunday morning because we come to church. But the question is, is the Lord my schedule? Meaning, is he the Lord of my day? Can he use me at any point in time or of the day? Or do I have to tell him later? See, but there's a next question. So we have three questions. The first is, am I available? The second question is simply this, am I willing? Because it really doesn't matter if you're available if you're not willing. Right? right? If somebody calls you on the phone, right, your phone could be right, like my phone is here right now, right? But if the phone rings and I'm not willing to answer it, it's pointless that I'm available. So the question becomes, even if you're available, are you willing to be used? Come on now. Are, are you willing to be used? Because sometimes we don't like the task that we're being asked Preach, to do. Girl. It doesn't look that attractive to us. Uh -huh. it, it doesn't give us a lot of attention. It, it actually requires too much. You know, it's like, I already did that. I'm tired. I don't feel it. So the question you have to ask is not only am I available, but am I willing? Uh -huh. yeah. See, your yes can't just be a yes. Right. based on what it is that somebody asked you to do. Yeah. So for instance, if your pastor says, hey, I have need of you, and you wait and feel, okay. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I need some more details. You know? right. I need you to come over here with me. What are we gonna do? See, we ask too many questions right. sometimes, right. and our questions block our blessing right. because Ooh. we are not willing to go and do Whatever we're asked to do, the question is not just are you available, the question are, is are you willing, and at the end of the day, if you're willing, then are you obedient to what you're willing to do? Are you obedient to his will? Being willing means are you obedient to his will? Is thy will be done? Or is it my will be done? Am I available? Am I willing? And last but not least, am I filled? Am I filled? Are you filled? The thing about this oil, I love me some oil. Because oil can do a lot. Right? So we, I don't have time to truly unpack this being filled. There's, but there's different types of being filled that we as believers need to understand. One is, as believers, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Am I filled? Do I understand the power that lies within me? This morning I was listening to a song called the Corinthian song. And it says, I am a vessel full of power. Holy Ghost power. Do you understand you are a vessel full of power? Am, am I filled? Because sometimes we cannot feel that power so we think it's not there. But it is there. But the second idea is... Do I understand, am I filled in a way that means I spent time with God? One thing I tell my leaders, and I started to tell them about spending time with God, spending time with devotions, most of them think, oh, here she go again, because I always ask, tell me about your devotional time. We, as people of God, we do want to serve. We are, some of us are available. Many of us are willing. But the problem is, by the time it comes to God's business, we're empty. By the time it comes to me serving, I'm empty. By the time it comes to me, you know, being used, I'm empty. So the question is, am I filled? Am I filled? Because it's hard. If I had a cup here, I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to pour out of an empty cup. And we need to be spending time with God in order to be filled back up so we could pour back out. Amen. And lastly, I just think about this um, idea of oil because in Isaiah 10, 27, he says the yoke shall be broken because of the anointing. The anointing, that's what they say, breaks every yoke. Am I filled? Do I have the oil in me? Yeah. Am I willing to be poured out? And I think of Paul as I sit down in Philippians 2.17. Paul in the midst of chains. Paul in the midst of persecution. Said I pour out my life yeah. like a drink offering. All right. I 
pour out my life like a drink offering. So the question today for all of you vessels, am I available, am I willing, and am I filled? Because God is going to give you an opportunity this week to be poured out. Amen? Amen. God bless you.